The fundamental theorems of calculus, uh, both the first and second theorems, tie integration and the derivative together. And this was not always obvious, but it was uncovered by Newton and Leibniz, forever changing calculus and our world. We're going to divide this up into two parts. In this first screencast, we're going to prove the fundamental theorems of calculus. The fundamental theorem of calculus. If a function, let's call it capital F, is an antiderivative of little f, and f is continuous on the interval from a to b, then the definite integral of little f of x dx from a to b is equal to the antiderivative evaluated at b minus the antiderivative evaluated at a. As it turns out, this is what links integration to differentiation, and it wasn't obvious to the discoverers of calculus originally, because little f of x is the derivative, and capital F is the antiderivative. So the fundamental theorem of calculus states that the definite integral from a to b of the derivative is equal to the antiderivative evaluated at b minus the antiderivative evaluated at a. So why does this work? Let's prove it. Our proof is actually going to involve what's called the second th fundamental theorem of calculus, which actually came afterwards. And in some tech, this is actually called the first fundamental theorem of calculus. But the way we're going to say it, this is the second fundamental theorem of calculus, states that if, if a function little f is continuous on a to b, and capital F is its accumulation function, the accumulated area, defined by capital F of x equals the integral from a to x of f of t dt, and, and t is a dummy variable, it can be anything, any variable we need it to be, for all the x's on the interval, and its derivative is little f. In other words, f of t dt represents the derivative of capital F of x. Then the second fundamental theorem of calculus states that the derivative with respect to x of the integral from a to x of that derivative function, f of t dt, equals f of x. We're going to go ahead and prove the second fundamental theorem of calculus first and then use it to prove the first fundamental theorem of calculus. So in our proof of the second fundamental theorem of calculus, we're going to let capital F of X be the area under the curve F of T. So little f of T is this actual function with respect to T. T is our variable. X is just some point along the interval from A to B. Capital F of X is the amount of area between A and X underneath this curve. So if we want to take the derivative of capital F of X, this is using the limit definition of derivative. So you need to go back, if you don't remember that, and kind of refresh yourself on it. But it's the limit, of, as delta X approaches 0, of capital F of X plus delta X minus capital F of X over delta X. And graphically, that's what this looks like. If we're trying to find the rate of change of this function, it's going to be the slope of the tangent lines between these two points, f of x plus delta x minus f of x over x plus delta x minus x, which is just delta x. So if we take out that delta x and put it out here, it's 1 over delta x. What we're left with is capital F of x plus delta x minus capital F of x. Capital F of x plus delta x is equal to this integral from a to x plus delta x of little f of t dt. This purple area is capital F of x plus delta x. It represents the accumulated area between a and x plus delta x, which we can rewrite with this first integral that you see here. And if we subtract out this reddish area here, which is capital F of x, representing the accumulated area from a to x, what we're left with is this area here. And that gets increasingly smaller as, as delta x gets smaller. So then the difference between them would actually be the limit as delta x approaches 0 of 1 over delta x times the integral from x to x plus delta x of little f of t dt. The integral from x to x plus delta x is this area right here, which we already know from as this delta x gets smaller and smaller, this becomes 
very close to the rectangle where f of x is the height and delta x is the width as delta x gets very small. Therefore, this becomes the limit as delta x approaches 0 of 1 over delta x times that little rectangle f of x delta x that's left. And guess what? The delta x's cancel out, which leads us only with f of x. So after all this work, it becomes simplicity defined. And we're back to the second fundamental theorem of calculus. As long as it's continuous and capital F represents an accumulation function, the derivative of the definite integral from a to x of f of t dt is equal to f of x. So let's use that to prove the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, let's talk about a new interval from p to q. And we're going to use a and b as well, but we're going to use new letters p and q to define the, the closed interval that we're going to evaluate this on. And let's assume that x is somewhere along that closed interval from p to q. So we're going to let capital F of x be the area that accumulates between p and x of f of t dt. So again, if this, is, this reddish function is f of t, then capital F of x is the accumulated area from p to x, where p is the lower endpoint. Well, if that's true, we know from the second fundamental theorem of calculus that the derivative of f, capital F of x, the derivative of that accumulation function is going to be f of x, because we proved that. We're going to let capital F of a be the accumulated area from p to a, and we can write, write that as capital F of a equals the definite integral from p to a of little f of t dt. In a similar way, we're going to let capital F of b be the accumulated area from p, our lower bound, to b. That's represented by this greenish area. And it's represented by the integral from p to b of f of t dt. So if those are two areas, f of a and f of b, then the difference between them, if we subtracted the big green area from this other area, capital F of b minus capital F of a is going to be the area that's between a and b. In other words, that accumulated area between a and b, represented by the definite integral of, from a to b of f of t dt, is actually equal to the difference between these two areas, capital F of b minus capital F of a. Capital F is the antiderivative of the function. So what this does is link the derivative, which is little f of t dt, to the antiderivative in a very powerful way, and we call this the definite integral. And it is the first fundamental theorem of calculus, which is usually written by reversing this term. So first fundamental theorem of calculus links the antiderivative to the derivative. It is also the process of how we do definite integration. If we're integrating something, a function from a to b, the definite integral can be evaluated by evaluating the antiderivative at b minus the antiderivative at a. Now you're possibly asking the question, what about the constant? Because an antiderivative, there's an infinite number of them. True statement. So if we integrated this function at a and b, we would get capital F of b, the antiderivative at b, plus a constant. And then if we integrated at a, we'd get the antiderivative of a plus c, plus that same constant. But as it turns out, those two constants are the same, so they're going to cancel each other out, leading us to f of b minus f of a. So we've proven the two fundamental theorems of calculus which link differentiation to integration and allow us to compute the definite integral.